Behavior Institute for Global Health and the John Field Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases and Professor of Biomedical Engineering here at Northwestern University. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us this afternoon for our latest installment of the Havey Institute and, uh, for Global Health First Friday Seminar Series. Uh, the title today is Investigating Persistent Malaria Transmission in Tanzania. Please take a moment to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, um, hashtag FSM Global Health. Uh, in addition, we welcome you to become an Institute member to receive access to specialized resources and services that support research infrastructure. For more information, please visit our website at very simple globalhealth.northwestern.edu backslash members. Today, we are very happy to have Dr. Fredros Okumo join us. He had given a work in progress uh, several weeks ago and is now here to give the first Friday seminar. Uh, Fredros is the Director of Science at Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania. He's a public health researcher and a mosquito biologist working on improved approaches for control of vector-borne diseases. Fredros is passionate about uh, improving ecosystems for young researchers in Africa. He also serves in, a, in a various advisory groups, including the WHO Malaria Policy Advisory Group, MPAG. Uh, Fred Rose did his original training at Moy University in Kenya, um, then went on to the, uh, got a master's degree at the University of Nairobi, another master's degree from Lund University in Geoinformation, Earth Observation, and Environmental Modeling, and finally his PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in, in London. So along the way, he got an MBA in International Health Management from the University of Basel. He's certainly traveled the world in the education circles. Fredros, we are really happy to have you here. Uh, there will be time for questions following the presentation in which we welcome you to submit your questions through the Q&A feature on, uh, the, uh, on the website here, on the, on the, in the meeting website. That's the best way to do it. It's on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Okay, now, Dr. Okumu, we turn it over to you. Uh, and thank you again very much for joining us. Take it away. Thank you very, very, very much, uh, Bob. It's uh, fantastic to join with you guys today. I think I'm probably the most excited, but also the most nervous, uh, given that I'm not able to do this in person, um, uh, but I think Zoom will do. So thank you guys so, so much for the invitation. As I highlighted already, we will be discussing today some of the work that we're doing in Tanzania and that has been done by others, but broadly, on, process, on uh, the studies to investigate persistent malaria transmission in Tanzania. Of course, uh, uh, a lot in my talk will also be derived from similar work that is being done elsewhere, but that drives towards a similar agenda uh, to drive malaria down eventually to zero at some point. I believe this is a subject that is interesting also to the community at Northwestern. And broadly, because uh, together with us, just like at Ifakara Health Institute, our mission is to improve people's health and well-being. And from the conversation that I've had with conversations that I've had with different people at Northwestern, I believe that this is the mission that we share. And therefore, I'm super excited today to uh, discuss with you this work. Now. Uh, uh, just in case there are people in, in the audience today who are not conversant with malaria as a disease, I just want to provide this very, very brief overview. Uh, in the uncomplicated form, it uh, uh, presents as fevers, you know, uh, uh, shields, headaches, and all that. But the dangerous part is when it gets complicated. So when you have severe malaria, in which case, especially for young kids, you have anemia, uh, seizures, respiratory distress, uh, sometime in cerebral form, you have cerebral malaria as well, and eventually death. So most of the malaria deaths are as a, are as a result of uh, uh, the severe form of, of malaria. Uh, it's a parasitic infection, and the commonest form is the one that is caused by Plasmodium falciparum. I have to say that there are four other malaria species, a uh, malaria parasite species uh, uh, that are known around the world. Uh, I think the most, the second most uh, known, best known is Plasmodium vivax. It's not very common in Africa. We find it mostly in the Indo-Pacific region, in Asia. In Africa, you have it also in the Horn of Africa, a few parts, a few other parts. We have uh, a few other species there as well, but about 
99% of all malaria infections we have in Africa are uh, plasmodium falsely prolonged. What about uh, transmission sites? So there are uh, uh, several mosquito species around the world, about 3,500 to be exact. Um, not exactly, but about 3,500 species that exist. Um, many of these ones are, are not malaria uh, mosquitoes, actually. There are some that transmit several other diseases, but about 400 species of mosquito species are of the Anopheles family. And of these, between 40 and 70 are known to transmit malaria to a certain degree. In Africa, however, the mosquitoes that are most dangerous are just these four. Anopheles gambis is a stricto, we say, just Anopheles gambi, Anopheles fenestus, Anopheles colutse, uh, which is very common in Western Central Africa, and then Anopheles arabiensis. Now, of course, they are related, Anopheles gambi and Anopheles uh, uh, colutse and Anopheles arabiensis were formerly thought to be actually one species. Uh, but then in different parts of Africa, you have other species of, of, of um, uh, Anopheles that play a significant role locally. But are not known to be um, um, to be broadly important. So we usually have to deal with just the four of them. The most notorious historically has been Anopheles gambi SS, but as we will see during my, my talk, uh, you will see that in many parts, uh, especially in Eastern and Southern Africa, this species has been eliminated locally. So a brief outline of my talk today, we will talk briefly, first of all, about the progress made against malaria as a disease to date, and then uh, some gaps in malaria control efforts. Uh, and then we will talk a lot about the entomological investigations. I myself am a mosquito biologist, so a lot of my work is really on mosquitoes. So we will talk quite a bit about that. A little bit about parasitological investig investigations that we do, including some of the work we do on diagnostics uh, um, uh, in Africa. And then we will, we will drive towards a conclusion. So to begin with, how much of a problem is malaria really? I mean, historically it was a global problem, but today it's mostly a crisis in Africa. It's mostly a problem in Africa. We have 241 million malaria cases globally. This is the data that we have from WHO, about 627,000 deaths. Of course, this is plus minus several thousands. But on average, uh, that's the data that WHO uh, gives us. I have to say that nearly all of those deaths uh, are in African children. Um, we could as well just say all of them, actually. But nearly 90%, 95% of these deaths are in Africa. And, and, and by that, I mean the WHO uh, region of Africa, which actually excludes some countries like Djibouti in, in, in the Horn of Africa and countries like Egypt up there. Uh, where are we today? So um, most malariologists base their calendars from the year 2000, and we usually talk about progress that has been made then since. I mean, there was a lot of work on malaria before that as well, but the, 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 the reckoning that malaria is really a problem that needs active duty uh, control has been there only since, since the year 2000. Therefore, uh, a lot of our efforts are based then. What we see is that, yes, indeed, there has been a lot of reduction uh, in malaria deaths, but in places such as uh, malaria cases, but in places such as Africa, we have also seen a doubling in population. So uh, Africa has used to have about 600, 000, 600 million people at the turn of the, uh, the century, uh, and now we have about 1.2 billion people. So uh, if, you, if you consider a country that had, let's say, 10 million people at that time, if they had 20% malaria prevalence, today they have 20 million people, double the population. Even if they had reduced their prevalence to just 10%, the actual number of cases would still be the same. So what you see in this graph, this is from WHO, is that in the year 2000, we had 241 cases for every 1,000 people. And this year, in two, the, the latest data we have is from 2020, you see exactly the same, 241 for every 1,000 people. So globally, in terms of incidence, that trend is very, very flat. Um, uh, even though uh, the, the actual prevalence has, has declined in several places, the number of deaths has gone down as well. The graph inset there is a graph of trends. So this is what the global technical strategy made by WHO had suggested that we should be doing. We should be going on the green line down there towards elimination at some point. Unfortunately, the data suggests that we have left that line. There's quite a big angle upwards. 
and 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 for example, we were supposed to be at 39 deaths per thousand, we are now 59. So it's a lot of countries are actually seeing an increase in malaria in recent years, suggesting that the progress that was being made has actually stagnated. So that is just for context, where are we starting from and why should we accelerate not just R&D, but also serious implementation and to get malaria as a disease down. Now, to Tanzania. Uh, uh, one of the most malarious countries, I would say, and nearly the whole country is malaria endemic, except a few parts. 37% of people still live in places considered to be of high malaria uh, burden. Uh, more than 30% parasite prevalence. This is work done by, um, actually, I think one of the authors is a colleague of yours now at uh, Northwestern, uh, fantastic work profiling uh, malaria across Tanzania. But most important here, a very big proportion of the people still live in areas considered to be of, uh, of high prevalence. Uh, and, and also just the whole country somehow is still a uh, malaria endemic. In that work also, what you've seen is that it is not uniform across the country. You see that you have a lot of malaria in the northwest. You also have a lot of malaria in the southeast. In the middle belt, you have a little bit less. Uh, in some places, far less. Uh, uh, but this fragmentation is something that, you know, has increased a lot in, in, in recent times. We, we used to have that, yes, especially because of uh, uh, climate differences. But now, as as, as control has improved, this fragmentation has, been, has, has also become very obvious. You start to have uh, places that had a lot of malaria that are now uh, uh, far less, um, um, uh, less malaria. If you if you go finer to finer details, if you go into like uh, smaller scales, let's say within districts, what you see is an even greater fragmentation, greater levels of heterogeneity. Here is an example from one of the places that we work. This is the Kilombero River Valley, about 450 kilometers out of Dar es Salaam in the southeast. And what you see there in a distance of just 20 kilometers, approximately 20, 30 kilometers, you see villages that have nearly 0% malaria or 1.3% up there in the north, and also villages that have nearly 50% malaria prevalence if you were to do a cross-section of the population. That level of heterogeneity is quite surprising uh, uh, given what we used to have back then. But it also means that we must now be very careful when we implement strategies for malaria control that we are not doing the same thing across the entire country or that we are not doing the same thing across the entire district, that we are making our decisions far more based on data and that we are responding effectively in case some of these places that have less malaria start to see a rebound. We will talk a little bit uh, uh, shortly about why we have these differences, or at least what we think uh, these differences are, are due to. And here is one example. This is Ifakara town. Ifakara town is right in the middle of this valley here that has a lot of malaria. It's right at the top of this. And historically, it used to be one of the most malaria zones. In recent times, we have done a lot of surveys here, going out there, trapping mosquitoes, chopping the heads of those mosquitoes, and checking if they are carrying any malaria in their in their gut. And after a year uh, and, and so of of trapping, we've ended up with 3,579 trap trap nights. We've some we've looked at all these mosquitoes, taken all of them to the lab individually, and we see nearly no malaria in that specific town. Now, of course, someone might ask, how can a small town in the middle of such a highly malaria zone have nearly zero uh, malaria? This is a very interesting uh, uh, subject for our investigation into the persistent malaria in this valley, and we will talk uh, a little bit about that. The other thing you see is a shift um, um, in the age uh, of, of children who, who have uh, in the age of, of people who have malaria, this is very recent data that we've just received. Uh, you see here that seasonality is still there, as, as, uh, as, as predicted, um, uh, a little bit of it. But you see that now you have a lot of malaria in older kids, uh, six to 10 year old, and sometimes even older data from Uganda suggests that school children actually now are contributing nearly 50% of all the malaria infections in those communities. And this is very, very important to, to, to note because a lot of efforts are focused on young kids. A lot of efforts are focused on children below the age of five and, and pregnant women, which we must continue to do. But we must also realize that if we want to go towards zero, 
we have to start putting some effort in the older age groups who carry malaria even if they are not apparently ill. So an important question then is if we've had all that progress, of course we recognize that because of population that progress is not apparent, but if we've had uh, so much progress, why then are we not going to zero? And then, I mean, if, if you talk to any malariologist or any public health expert in my country, there will be a lot of, you know, uh, uh, reasons put forth as to why we still do not have zero. In my analysis, we have uh, 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 grouped them into three um, uh, different categories, the software-related ones, hardware-related ones, and leadership or accountability-related concerns. Uh, you've seen we have I think the most important really is the weak health systems that is common across many low and middle income countries, uh, poor data quality and use, um, uh, uh, suboptimal compliance, and then also just awareness, the knowledge in communities of certain aspects of the disease, growing population, I've talked a lot about that, uh, which is a situation that we have to continue dealing with. It's not as bad per se, but I think it's impacting, broadly speaking, how much we must continue investing in malaria. In perfect interventions, we have some great tools for malaria control, but they're not the best. We still do not have, for example, a perfect vaccine that would give you 90 plus percent reduction in cases. Uh, the, the best tools we have about against malaria now uh, for, on prevention side are really just you know, 40% or so a reduction in prevalence. We have some great treatments though, but broadly speaking, imperfect interventions often applied imperfectly. Growing resistance, both in drugs and in insecticides that we use to kill the mosquitoes. And then of course, very, very challenging epidemiology, often also with high levels of, uh, of low income or poverty, if you like. From leadership side, limited financing, a lot of funding has been coming here from here in the United States. Uh, 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 countries are contributing just on average about 30% 30, 30 of what they need uh, to, to control disease. So there we need to make some progress. And then you have uh, technical gaps as well. Uh, in, in recent times, we've seen that these are not unique uh, to any countries. They're not unique to Tanzania in this specific case. But unfortunately, for some places, you have a convergence of these risks, you have of these of this threats. You have, for example, in the north, in, the, in, in Eastern Africa, in the Horn of Africa, you have um, uh, anti-malarial drug resistance there. You have uh, reduced performance of of diagnostic, some of the diagnostics we use for testing malaria are no longer performing well because the mosquitoes have mutated, so you cannot detect the same proteins that you would otherwise detect. Uh, and then you have an invasive species from, from the Arabian Peninsula, Anopheles tiffensi, which was traditionally not African mosquito, but it's very good at spreading malaria in the urban centers where historically we've seen greater progress than in rural areas. So uh, uh, why do we, when, when we investigate the, the, the question of persistent malaria uh, in any country, and of course in Tanzania, we have to look at two arms. We have to look at the parasitological side. We have to also look at the entomological side. Uh, and then in recent times, we've also started to look at the human side, you know, the anthropological basis of this persistent transmission. So we'll walk through over that, uh, through that in the next five minutes and see how, how, how far we go. And to begin with, let's, let's think about the mosquito. I talked, I said earlier that we have about four species in Tanzania. There's actually only two major species, Anopheles gambia and Anopheles finestas. In some places, Anopheles arabiensis plays a significant role as well. One important aspect of these mosquitoes is their love for human beings and their love for staying inside houses. So if you look at this figure, this fantastic analysis here suggesting that these mosquitoes, and often the three mosquitoes, and often Gambia, and often Sarabiensis, and often Finestris, they really, really love to feed on humans. Of course, we know now that Anopheles rabiensis is a little bit facultative. Uh, uh, this desire is not, it's not, um, it doesn't insist as much. If you have like bed nets over you, the mosquito will get out it will try to feed outside or feed on, on animal, other animals. But an office gambi and an office finestas tend to insist quite a lot. And that is the reason that for an office gambi, uh, uh, we have a situation where when people used bed nets very well, and if those bed nets were insecticidal, we ended the situation where this mosquito actually disappeared. But now we have the other mosquito, Anopheles finestas, which behaves exactly like Anopheles arabiensis, but didn't disappear when bed nets came. And one of the questions we try to ask is why? Why Anopheles finestas did not disappear 
when insecticide-assisted bed nets were used at scale before bed nets, before insecticide resistance came. And so a big portfolio of our work currently is on uh, this, 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 this mosquito that now turns out to carry about 85% of all the malaria transmission events. Uh, it's dominant in Eastern Southern Africa. It's highly resistant to pyrethroids. It's difficult to rare inside laboratories. In fact, most people do not even have it in the colony, so it's difficult to study. A lot of our work is, is focused focused on that. And this is how we ended up to this situation. If you look at this figure here, probably a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. You see that when we started studies in the southeastern part of Tanzania in the 1990s, uh, if you did any mosquito collections in the field, about, you know, 100% of them were in Gambia. Gambi. Uh, at the turn of the century, in the year 2000, to the, between 2001, 2003, you see that proportion reduced to about 8%. Now that other 20% was taken over by other mosquitoes. By 2008, only about 20% of the mosquitoes were not the Gambi since restricted. 80% were now something else. Now, if you, if you follow this keenly, you look here, we have data from 2008, 2009, 2011, and 2012. And you look at the proportions constituted by Anopheles Gambi, it continues to reduce to the extent that by 2012, we were no longer catching it at all with any of the traps that we put out there. At the, at the same time, you start to look, okay, so if you are no longer catching the mosquito that was the most notorious, what are you catching? At that time, we were catching something else. It's called Anopheles arabiensis. It's very closely related to Anopheles gambi. But then we realized we were missing a different mosquito, the Anopheles fenestas. It was appearing there as well, but we were not getting it because we, it doesn't behave exactly the same and we do not have exactly the same uh, uh, um, system to get it. Today, when we do collections intensively, what we, what we see is uh, a series of mosquitoes here, a, a, a number of different vector species here. But what's more interesting is, is when you take these mosquitoes to the lab and look at which ones are actually uh, transmitting malaria, you see a very interesting picture. Here you see in one study in 2017, we published work where we investigate, we collected 20,000 Anopheles radiances. We collected 5,000, or just under 5,000 Anopheles fenestas, and yet 86% of all the malaria that we caught, in, we got in the village were associated with just this one species. At this time, of course, Anopheles gambi had disappeared. This is data from Western Kenya, very related to here. And you see that as the bed net implementation went ahead, Anopheles gambi disappeared. And then now you have a different species taking over. These are very important things for us to monitor. Uh, we, we see the, the, the rise of Anopheles fenestras in Eastern Africa and also in Tanzania. Uh, as we see from this latest data, not yet published, suggesting 12,000 Anopheles arabiensis, only 424 Anopheles fenestas, and yet about 80% of all the malaria we catch in these villages are associated with just this single species. Now, why is this important? This is important because these mosquitoes behave differently. These mosquitoes respond differently physiologically. And therefore, if you want to control them effectively, you must not just know which ones are there, but actually which ones are important. You don't want to put your resources on the 12,000, yet they carry nearly no malaria. Instead, you want to look for the 424 and put your resources there. And that is what we do. So we do a lot of studies on you know, the, the ecology of these mosquitoes, which house types do they like, which kind of habitats do they breed inside. We look at mosquito, different house types, different breeding habitats, which ones of them actually uh, do these mosquitoes like. And then on that basis, we can do calculations such as, for example, here, after a series of surveys, we see that actually only about 4% of all the water bodies we see carry uh, late stage fenestas, Anopheles fenestas. Now, those who study mathematics, you see immediately that it is very important for control because you don't want to go out there and start dealing with every water body. Okay, you want to spend some time and, and actually work with the water bodies that are important. And here we see that it's a very small proportion of these water bodies that actually we should pay attention to. And, 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 and it means, therefore, that if we had an intervention that could target Anopheles fenestas very well as adults, like bed nets here, and also very well in the aquatic stages, we could probably make much greater progress. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, recent times, we've started to say, okay, 
how do these populations change in the in the wild? How do these populations vary during the the, the season? We just published today um, this work on the um, uh, on, on the uh, population dynamics of anopheles finestras that allows us for the first time to be able to predict what the populations are going to look like, what uh, aspects of the climate that they are most sensitive to, and how we can improve control with what we have plus anything else. In summary, the key characteristics of these mosquitoes is that they bite primarily humans, primarily inside the houses, they mostly rest inside the houses. They're highly resistant to pyrethroids used in bed nets. Their adult densities peak much later uh, uh, after the rainy season. They survive longer than other mosquitoes, and therefore they are much more efficient malaria vectors than others. We have a, a new, a fantastic new study that has come out of Tanzania lately that suggests that fortunately, very, very fortunately, certain new net types that do not carry just pyrethroids, but carry pyrethroids plus something else, a different active ingredient, can be very effective against this vector. This is a study from northern Tanzania, about 40% reduction in prevalence in an area that was 90%, 94% and office finesters. So I think that gives us some hope that we can instead uh, indeed make progress against this otherwise very difficult uh, vector. Now, a lot of the studies that I've talked about requires a lot of work, it requires a lot of uh, human labor, it requires a lot of field investigations. As you can see here, we have to dissect mosquitoes, for example, trap a lot of mosquitoes, dissect a lot of these mosquitoes before we can, uh, uh, we can, we can tell what's happening. And that is important because all these metrics require both the entomological metrics that you see on this figure and the epidemiological metrics need to be assessed with some level of accuracy uh, and with some level of consistency uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to have the right intervention. At the moment, unfortunately, we've been doing this mostly by human um, labor uh, and a lot of field work. For this uh, to change, we need new mechanisms to do these investigations. So at the moment, after dissections, we do PCRs and analysis. But clearly, if you want to do this at scale for like the whole country, you need most countries, uh, you need to, to, uh, to have something that is scalable. Uh, and uh, you have something that is, you have to need to have something that is a uh, low cost. Uh, uh, you need to have something that can be done without special, uh, specialty skills. So there's clear need for improved approaches to assess these metrics. Most countries, unfortunately, do not have adequately trained staff. Most countries uh, 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 do not have the, the equipment that is necessary in every district to do these assessments. And that brings me to the, uh, the, the third part of my work, uh, of, of the work that my colleagues and I do. We've been working a lot. Um, uh, first of all, before I go to that, I just want to show you that uh, Another reason that you need this is as malaria goes down, as you start to have let, uh, less malaria, the relationship between the entomological indicators and the epidemiological indicators starts to win uh, out, starts to be very weak. So if you look at this graph, for example, you see at times of high prevalence, you see some kind of relationship that is fairly strong correlation there. But as malaria goes down, that relationship becomes weak. It means that you can no longer use entomological measures to predict what is happening on the epidemiological scale. So we need to improve on that. Now, in Tanzania, we are working a lot uh, uh, to find new mechanisms. And one of the approaches that we've been investigating is the simple is the use of a combination of machine learning uh, uh, algorithms and mid-infrared spectroscopy. This is a technique that we started using about five years ago, and I think we've made some great progress with it. I would like to share a little bit of that with you. Uh, a simple analysis, simple spectroscopes uh, uh, from um, uh, you know off-the-shelf spectroscopes. We use this to scan the mosquitoes. We get the spectra, and then we can feed this. Uh, we, we can transform this spectra and and and, and use uh, simple algorithms to analyze that to try and predict the real. Uh, characteristics, either entomological or parasitological characteristics, and we validate that using real data. Hopefully, eventually, this will replace the laborious and expensive techniques that we currently use. The, the reason this works is that either the mosquito or the blood uh, 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 slides or, or parasites have certain unique uh, uh, features that can be picked up as different uh, absorbance rates in the, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum. 
And based on these characteristics, we can analyze carefully with very simple equipment such as this uh, very portable spectrometer here. We can analyze these characteristics and be able to tell uh, either entomological uh, aspects of it or parasitological. Here are some examples of progress we've made in recent times. We have very, very been very, very successful uh, with being able to tell whether a mosquito blood fed on a human being or a cow or chicken, for example, just by look, by scanning the abdomen of a blood-fed mosquito and analyzing that spectrum. We've been uh, able to tell uh, whether this is a malaria species or a non-malaria species. We've been able to tell the different, the, the, the four different malaria species just by looking at the spectra that is emerging from the thorax and the head. And uh, uh, recently we published uh, some new work that suggests we can, not, we can tell not only how old these mosquitoes are and how and which species there are, but we can also tell whether certainly any intervention put against these mosquitoes is actually working in the field. So this has been very successful as well, and we are hoping to validate. We have work ongoing now to validate this in many different countries. Uh, it has also worked uh, very well, uh, at least preliminarily, for certain parasitological investigations. Here is a common problem that we face. You go into the villages and you cannot always, especially as malaria goes to older age groups, you are not always very good at telling who is sick, who, are not, who is not sick, because people are not apparently ill, even if they are still carrying a lot of parasites. And what we've been able to do is just by taking blood smears and dry blood spots, and detecting and uh, scanning this in, in the little spectroscopes, we've been able to tell with fairly good accuracy who is infected with plasmodium and who is not infected. So this is something that we would like to continue uh, doing to scale up a little bit more to just uh, in, in an attempt to develop scalable techniques for investigating persistent malaria in Tanzania and beyond. Ongoing work include, of course, the field validation, uh, from the vector side, but from the parasitological time side, we are also looking at de uh, determining the thresholds uh, below which this cannot be useful. Can it be useful in clinical settings versus uh, 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 field survey screening settings? Can it be used in different levels of the, in places with different levels of endemicity? Uh, you know, like if you have a lot of malaria pre uh, prevalence or very low prevalence, can this still be used? So we are doing those studies at the moment. The last part of these investigations include anthropological investigations. This is really to think about it from the human uh, side. What are the people doing? Where are they? Uh, um, are they exposed? Uh, what, what occupations are they involved in? And what is their sleeping pattern, waking pattern, et cetera, et cetera. What you see here is some uh, uh, results that we, when we started investigating this, uh, some of the early studies that we saw from very simple observations and discussions with people in the communities. If you look at the time when they are awake and what they are doing in the evening, uh, from 6 p.m. to the following morning at 6 a.m., you know, either people are cooking, eating, watching television, or whatever. <clears throat> Sometimes they do this because the house is small. They do this outside the house in some small makeshift kitchens, for example, or just in front of the house in the yard. You see, this is very correlated. Uh, very well correlated to the mosquito biting behavior, both vector species, but especially Anopheles rabiensis here, and that when people go to bed, uh, uh, you, this is the time when they have they are under bed nets, so the risk there is kind of less. But before 10 p.m., there is no bed net use, and so there's a lot of risk associated with with that kind of outdoor biting, and it means we must continue to find tools uh, that can be used to do that. Just to round this up, let's let's go back and say, okay, so we've seen this a broad scale, uh, you know, stratification, and we've seen this fine scale stratification, and we've also seen the different characteristics, which vectors are transmitting the disease, at what time uh, is, is the infection happening? Is it mostly inside or outside? What is is this persistent malaria really associated with uh, uh, at the baseline? You know, what what can we do? to go towards zero and what can we do that doesn't depend if you wanted to escape this these variations what is it that you can do that that is agnostic kind of uh, to these variations one of the things we see is housing situation and, and obviously uh, this is something that personally bothers me a lot because i know that whatever we do in terms of bed nets or insecticides or drugs unless we really deal with the basic 
uh, infrastructure is going to continue to be quite a big problem now despite overall growth in housing and, and we have seen uh, very very uh, uh, clear evidence here that for some people especially the low income households they still in live, live in houses with very poor wall types very big gaps in the eave spaces um, uh, 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 windows sometimes un uncovered uh, the doors are probably left open and from an anthropological anthropological perspective this is always very interesting because even where i come from at home in the evening we leave the door open so the chicken can come into the house uh, but that's also the time that a lot of mosquitoes get into the house so uh, taking care of human uh, community needs and in the design of new houses is an important thing we've published a few uh, study uh, recently in, in the journal of nature so with, with colleagues that where we showed that after since the year 2000 the proportion of africans who live in houses you would consider improved has doubled what this suggests is that fortunately for housing there is an innate drive among human uh, uh, households among people to improve their own houses so they are building better houses just taking them a long time and those improvements are fairly modest they're not like people building bungalows or machinettes it's really like people getting from touch roofs into like a little brick house it takes them years to put these window shades uh, it takes them years to, to put that but they accumulate their own money and eventually they put something and, and we actually believe now based on the evidence that we have that this is one reason that the town of Ifakara as an example has reduced malaria to nearly zero because here you have much better houses it's not as touch uh, and then of course you, have, you also have uh, uh, health care access which is much better in the urban setting the other thing, of course, is insecticide resistance. This is now widespread across Africa and drug resistance. I talked about that means mosquitoes are no longer able to kill. Uh, this bed nets are no longer able to kill mosquitoes. We, we have a particular problem with insecticide treated bed nets, even though now new, new types of nets are coming in. But the other method used for malaria control is spray. Now for that, we are fortunate that we still have a few insecticide classes against which mosquitoes are not resistant that we can use for the next few years. Uh, another challenge that, that we have to fix is the fact that bed nets are not lasting long enough in, in these villages. In this image here, you see again a study from our institution, Atifakara and colleagues, where we show that even though the companies keep telling us that these bed nets are going to last for three years at least, the real evidence from the villages suggests that in within you know just a few months, within 22 months here, for example, about 30 to 40 percent of the uh, only about 30 to 40 percent of the nets are still in good condition inside the house. The rest of them are either attritioned out of the house or are too torn to be used. And that is something we have to fix given that bed nets are our, remain our primary uh, uh, intervention against the disease. Uh, lastly, uh, not, not lastly, but also important is the aspect of the people, as I said. You know, we, we have to speak more to the communities. We have to look at how they live, uh, what they do, uh, what they like, uh, uh, and incorporate them in these decisions uh, 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 to uh, make greater advancements um, uh, and, and to, to seal the gaps that remain in, in malaria control. Unfortunately, we are in a situation where, and I spoke about this last time when, when I talked to your colleagues, unfortunately, we are in this situation where today, uh, malaria control is kind of commoditized. Uh, instead of like focusing on other things such as housing or environmental management, we are really about commodities, insecticide, drugs, and diagnostics. There is an advantage to that in the sense that those things are much more scalable. But I think you uh, go into this challenge where you have to always keep doing the same or repeat uh, the, the, the distribution of nets, so uh, try to raise insecti insecticide and drug resistance by innovating against new ones, and that is something that we will not uh, be able to beat very easily. Lastly is the question of money. I mentioned this earlier, uh, but the more important part here is that even though populations are increasing, and so you need more of these commodities, inflation and other commodity and other, other, other factors lead to increased prices. So, so uh, a standard malaria control program actually now needs more money than they needed uh, in the year 2000 per capita to control malaria just because prices, uh, prices have gone up. And the disease, uh, as, as, as you reduce the disease, you have this situation where now most of the deaths are happening in very difficult to reach areas. Uh, I said earlier that 
the severe form of malaria is the most dangerous one. In Africa, we have this situation where it is also happening in places where you have very, uh, we have the least trained doctors because severe malaria is happening in the remotest parts of the countries. It's happening in the places where uh, the best hospital is probably a local health center or a dispensary. Um, and, 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 and it also happens to be the places where you have most malaria. And this is a challenge that will continue with us until we fix the healthcare system. In summary, we've looked at the attributes. Uh, the current studies that we have are, are really looking at the attributes of this persistent malaria. Why is it important? Uh, but also looking at the, the risk factors, which is the human factors that I've spoken about and what we will need to do to control it. Just to highlight a, a few of these, uh, you know, we, we we are looking at where is biting happening the most. Uh, can we control it just inside and also outside? And then what we need to do next uh, to drive towards um, uh, towards zero. Our colleagues are spending a lot of time. Uh, myself and my colleagues are spending a lot of time uh, supporting ecosystems to have more young people come into the. The, the scene to participate in malaria control. I know this is something that you do a lot also at Northwestern, and, and, and we appreciate that. I think it's going to be very, very important going into the future to have uh, uh, you know greater involvement of, of, of young people to just increase the workforce for both research and implementation against the disease. What can we do to improve the technologies? There's a lot that we can do. Uh, some examples of what I think would be possible here is number one is to optimize the existing tools even if we do not have new tools yet can we improve our bed nets for example so they don't get torn easily uh, uh, can we improve formulations for medicines the other thing is to stay invested uh, in research and this is a big 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 component of the work that myself and my colleagues do so that we can have new interventions for example can we have monoclonal antibodies tested much faster uh, the gene drives is an important technology that is possibly going to transform malaria control. Can we improve investments uh, on that? And lastly is the transformation of approaches uh, and regulation systems. And an important um, example, uh, one example here is really how do we put one, two, or three interventions together to get an optimum, optimum uh, uh, benefit from that? Can we do things such as improving our tax systems or, or local manufacturing to have these interventions uh, in place? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to stop there so we can have some conversation. But really just to say again, thank you so, so much for giving me an opportunity to have this conversation broadly. And hopefully in future, we can have a lot closer conversations about different aspects that I've spoken about today. Back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fredros. What an interesting talk that touches on so many different aspects of the malaria problem. We have um, one question in the Q&A now, and I encourage everyone to, to pop your questions in there so we can get um, some insights from Fredros. Um, ben To has a question about the spectrometer and machine learning methods, and he asks if, it, if um, this methodology is capable of telling the sporozoite rate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for the question. Y yes, indeed. So broadly speaking, yes, indeed. Um, we have looked at this in two ways. I didn't present the results here, but we've looked at this in two ways. Number one, with the, the traditional method for detecting sporozoite infections with mosquitoes is you trap these mosquitoes, you chop off their heads, you run that in an ELISA system, and uh, you detect the CSP uh, uh, protein, uh, the plasmodium uh, falciparum CSP. Uh, in the ELISA plates. So one of the things we've tried is, okay, get all these mosquitoes, and then before you squash, before you, you crush the head and, 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 and put it through an uh, um, uh, ELISA system, uh, you scan that mosquito first in, in these spectrometers that we have. So we've tried that, and then we've tried to, you know, we've trained the, the algorithms with the same mosquitoes and, and checked if we could predict what the outcome of the ELISA readings would be. And in that uh, case, uh, both in the lab mosquitoes, the, you know, so you, we can infect the mosquitoes in the lab and do this, or we can do this in the field, just catching mosquitoes in the field and doing that. In both cases, 
we can predict this with fairly good accuracy. So we have some work that is currently being written and that will be published soon on, on that. The second way we've tried to do this is through a PCR analysis. And the, the reason that it's important to do both is because at this stage, we still do not know what the underlying biochemical uh, 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 signal that the spectra is picking up. Mm -hmm. We used to think that either it's looking at the distortion in the red blood cells, or, or maybe you know some hemoglobin-based markers, uh, or maybe it's seeing the parasite itself. So we don't know yet. So uh, we are doing the different you know, you know proven methods and then trying to predict and seeing if you can predict across the methods. But broadly, yes, uh, the mid-infrared spectroscopy together with machine learning algorithms are pretty good at predicting plasmodium sporozoites in the mosquito just as, as they were in predicting a, a, a plasmodium in human blood a specimen bacteria. Address, have you looked for oocysts as well with your method? Is that possible? Uh, I, I would imagine it's possible. We haven't done that. Uh, I think that one of the challenges with the oocysts is the dissection. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as I said, we are trying to run away from dissections. We do a lot of it now to tell how old mosquitoes are, for example, whether they are um, uh, uh, how many times they have laid eggs, whether they are mated or not, and it's, it's quite a tedious exercise. Our best dissectors can do a maximum of 200 mosquitoes a day. Uh, that's already considered super high, um, uh, but it's not, it's not something that we have done yet. So to develop the technology to look for OSIS would require more, would require dissection. You're saying that like you're always going to need this dissection step or? No, so only for validation. So only for validation, got it. Only for validation. I think, I mean, and again, that's, I think, why it's important for us to know what the actual marker, the spectroscopy system mm -hmm. is looking at, because once we know that, then some of these steps we can skip. But at the moment, we don't know. So we have to validate everything on the basis of what we can actually detect, uh, either phenotypically or, or in a genotype marker. Got it. All right, so we have four more questions here. Um, from Claudia Hawkins, what is contributing to the increased predominance of funestus? Is it a fitness thing? And if so, what characteristics? Uh, excellent question. What is contributing to the fitness of funestus? I don't know, really. Uh, you know, until about 2017, we didn't even study Anopheles funestus in our lab. We, we, we always caught it and we, you know, we, we recorded it and we said that hey, we caught so many finances. We, it, and like many entomologists, this is the, a vector we ignored because we just can't keep it in the laboratory. It's, in, it's been impossible to create a laboratory colony of this mosquito. Uh, in our lab, we have a colony now um, uh, that, that we, are, we are developing. And we also have a colony that we adopted from South Africa, which is the only group that had a colony in 2000, since 2000. And that has allowed us to make a lot of studies. But the other thing is we've gone into the village and started to do these studies uh, with filial generation one, wild caught mosquitoes. You rare them, you get the first progeny and you study that. What we see is number one, this mosquito developed resistance much earlier than the other mosquitoes. So in comparative tests, for example, we see it's almost 10 times or seven times more resistant than Anopheles arabiensis, which is the other member we find. Uh, uh, it's, it, it resists higher doses of insecticides. It's also a much smaller mosquito. Uh, we know now that it survives much longer. Uh, it lives much longer than the others, by an average of nearly 10 days longer uh, than the other mosquitoes. So we believe that we will have a good, uh, comprehensive answer to why to its, its fitness. We just know it's much fitter than, than the other mosquitoes, and we are really trying to understand that because now it's also carrying 90%, nine in every 10 new malaria infections are because of this single species. So instead of just broadly doing vector control, we want to focus on this single species and do as much control as possible. That makes sense. Uh, question from Baba Femi Taiwo. Did I correctly hear that there's an area in Tanzania with no infected mosquitoes? If so, can you talk more about the area and the reasons for this? Uh, did I? Well, you did imply that you collected tens of thousands of mosquitoes and oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't see any. <laughs> if I got a town, yes. Yeah. Um yes. 
Yes, yes. At least according to the data we have. And if you read our paper, we say, for example, that based on the trapping techniques that we deployed, we were unable to catch any infected mosquito. So there are two possibilities here. Number one, which is likely, is that in that environment, there's no local transmission happening. And that the, the environmental changes plus the control measures have done such a good job in locally eliminating transmission. And, and so it gives us hope that that's a possibility. But the other possibility is that the tools that we commonly use for studying persistent malaria or residual malaria, if you like, have a certain limitation in terms of their sensitivity in low transmission settings. And I think this is a common problem with all diagnostics and all entomological tools that the sensitivity kind of wins, uh, even for diagnostics, the positive predictive value for most diagnostics uh, for malaria starts to be very poor uh, when the disease goes towards zero. So that's a possibility, but just based on hospital data observations, the frequent screening, uh, if, because we do also the epidemiological surveys, we also do pricks, you know, just go to households and ask people if they're willing to get pricked, adults and kids, and we get zero, zero prevalence in that particular area. So I think the more we do this, the more confident we will be, but I don't think we will reach a stage where we say absolute zero. Yeah, um, kind of a related question from Ethel Guasira. What are the effects of social cultural factors on malaria elimination in Tanzania? Uh, well, that's a broad question. Social cultural factors. Yeah, that's a broad question. I think the only studies we've done here are really, so we've, we've done two studies. Our anthropological surveys are based on observations. Um, and, and when we started, we used to send people to go and observe, but then we changed the method because people you know, don't like to be, a, mosquito studies are nighttime mosquitoes, malaria studies, most of them are nighttime. So you can't always have someone observing. So we, we, we changed where we recruited households where there was a youngster who was willing to be involved in the study to do the observation. So they observed themselves. And, and you, you see relationships with things such as occupation, you know, people who go to the, you know, we have, for example, a small subpopulation in rural Tanzania that are itinerant farmers or migra migratory farmers. And for about six months during the year, they spent time in distant river valleys tending to their crop. And during that period, they are exposed to quite a lot of biting, but there's not a lot of malaria there because there are few people. Uh, and when they come, whatever they did in treat, especially when they're adults, they still have a lot of sponsors. So that, that's, that's, that's a factor that we see as a lot of, we, we study this quite a lot as well, the itinerant farmer situation. But then you have the rest, such as, you know, just people wanting to leave their doors open. And, you know, from outside, you may say, hey, close your door. But actually, if people have a small house and they also keep livestock there, like chicken, you can't force them to lock the door in the evening because they must keep the door open. This is free range chicken. The chicken must come home to roost, right? I do this as well. And my, I mean, my mother does that too. I can't stop her. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of all these things and, and we have to just study them in detail and find what is the, what's the way. The, the fact that people cook outside the house instead of inside the house, people watch television communally or soccer communally. And when they do that, there's a lot of exposure. We have to study in, in Zanzibar, our studies in Zanzibar revealed that up to 30% of the new infections were associated with this outdoor behavior. Um, but of course, broadly in Africa, most transmission is still happening inside the house. Yeah. All right, another pretty broad question. How feasible is malaria elimination in Sub-Saharan Africa with the presence of persisting neglected tropical diseases such as hookworm, trypanosomiasis, and others? Yeah, that, that question has got two parts. Uh, number one is you have, a, you have a situation, you have a complex situation with multiple diseases. Uh, and so you can't just focus on one disease. So it's a question of resources really. And to, to address this, you must have uh, uh, socioeconomic improvements alongside your disease control. So you have to do what China did. So China was cleared, was declared malaria free last year. And their story is not just uh, malaria control only. It was a lot of pulling people out of poverty and also malaria control. 
and you have to do both in Africa. And, and so that helps to answer the first part of the question is how feasible is it? And we do not believe, at least I do not believe, that we should be speaking about malaria elimination in Africa until we address the socioeconomic concerns, especially given that as malaria goes down, the remaining proportion is increasingly concentrated among the poor. So we will have to do a lot of investment in protecting the poor, improving their houses, ensuring they have good education, ensuring they have good access to healthcare before we can start talking about elimination of not just malaria, but also all these other things that you that you've mentioned. And that question was from Steady Mushaya Basa. So next question, we really have so many today. Thank you everyone for asking questions. From Irene Huang, she says, thanks for your talk. Your presentation touches a lot on how housing type has a huge impact on being bitten at night and that building better housing is a good intervention. But since building houses is a very slow process, would implementing policies help? And do you have any plans on working with the government to do so? I love the question. Uh, I love the question a lot, actually. Um, it touches on what is it the country, the government can do to accelerate improvements in housing. So, of course, one way you could say, let's build everybody a house. You know, some countries do that. If you have resources, you could do that. And I know even in my own country, governments can occasionally take a loan from the Chinese and build a short road for billions of dollars. And sometimes I wonder, hey, why don't they take a loan and make sure every poor person has a good house? So <laughs> maybe when I become president, I will do that. But, but we're not there yet. So I think that what you can do now is things such as, you know, taxes or subsidies. You could say, for example, housing construction materials must be import, can be imported tax-free. You know, you can have subsidy, subsidies on, on prices and things like that accelerate because clearly we see very good evidence that people want better houses. Even lower income earners, they save a big proportion of their money and they, they put a window this year, next year they buy the, the door, the other year they buy metal roof, and over 10 years, they have built a house. You can accelerate that process by making those commodities cheaper, by improving local designs. So I, I think that from a, a one government policy perspective, there's a lot that you can do to accelerate this process that clearly there's a very good evidence people like uh, to do on their own. But broadly, that's a fantastic question, I think. Yeah. A uh, question from Edgar Dabira. Could you elaborate a bit of the spectrometry and evaluation of the impact of the intervention? Do you think with this technology, we will not need the traditional methods of collections to assess, for, for instance, the impact of mass drug administration of ivermectin? Uh, uh, that's good. Good question as well. We do not think that we want to use this technology to replace the existing ones for two reasons. Number one is that at this stage, the, so the main motivation for going here is the need for scale. And if uh, one thing I didn't mention is that in 2016, WHO also asked countries to consider surveillance as a core intervention. So rather than just as a method to measure interventions, surveillance is supposed to be in itself an intervention. So good surveillance responses is actually necessary. Now to do that, you need to be a, you need methods that can be scaled. You need things that can be done at low cost in large, in, in large scale. And we don't have that for malaria at the moment. We have things that are expensive, things like PCR in, in many African settings, you're not going to scale them to every district or every district hospital or a dispensary. So we are developing technologies that could allow both entomological surveillance and parasitological surveillance to be done at scale without necessarily a PhD holder. We think that this is something that the spectroscopy and machine learning algorithms, and especially now because we are starting to put our, our work online, uh, uh, building, for example, user interfaces that people can just plug in their data and read out. Uh, we believe that that's, a, that's something we can solve, but we don't think we will replace PCR and we don't want to. <laughs> the second is that this is not a, a clinic, clinical management tool not meant that's not the purpose just like in epidemiology this my teacher always insisted that you must keep remember the difference between screening and diagnostics you know the screening tool is really to assess the population level uh, indicators it is not 
to implement the case management or, or treatment. So we are really developing a screening tool here. All right, well, um, we are at the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and thank you again, Fredros. That was really fabulous. I loved it. Um, and I'm going to read the approved uh, script for, for, for the ending and closing out the, um, the webinar today. So thank you very much to Fredros for taking the time to share your insight and expertise with us today. Thank you also to our audience for joining us and for submitting your thoughtful questions, really some excellent questions today. We invite you to join us for the next installment of the Institute seminar series, which will continue on Friday, July 8th with Dr. Bethany Het Gautier, with who is a biostatistician specializing in health systems and implementation science research in Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, thank you for joining us today. For those that have registered, a recording of the webinar will be shared via email. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy weekend.